Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And you might have noticed that there is not, and me, Joy J. Moore, because she is on a flight somewhere. Her flight got rescheduled and had intended to be here and uh, is not. So we will miss her. Uh, but we will carry on with December 24, 2024, the Nativity of Our Lord. And the readings are Isaiah 9, 2 through 7, Psalm 96, Titus 2. 11 through 14, and then Luke 2, 1 through 14, and you can add the rest of the birth narrative, 15 through 20. But we should also say this is the text also for Christmas Day. So you might want to listen to that podcast as well, if you're depending on where you're dropping down in the Luke 2 story. Did I miss anything, Matt? I think that's right. We'll have more to say about Luke 2 and the other podcasts, so that's a, an incentive to listen to both. Is there anything else that's special about December 24th that we should lift up? Oh, let's see. Oh, I know. It's my birthday. Longtime listeners probably already know that, but happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, it was always a special day. I never had that feeling of, oh, wow. I'm so sorry for you that you're born on Christmas Eve yeah. because my parents always made it very special. So I Good. always look forward to my birthday. Good. Well, yeah. happy birthday. It's kind of fitting that Joy is unable to be here because of travel difficulties because of Luke chapter two, which has a different kind of travel difficulty, forced travel, and then um, problems with securing lodgings. Yes. Good point. Yeah. Well, and that does, I think, tie into the way in which this story is going, the Luke story is going to unfold. Uh, not so much, not not so much uh, travel difficulties <laughs> along the way, but just this sort of the challenges. Right? It's not an easy. It's not an easy birth. It's not a. It's not an easy story, and Jesus' message is not an easy story, and will be met with a lot of resistance over the course of over the course of uh, Jesus' ministry. And so, that narration of of those challenges are actually quite fitting, I think, for a gospel that is going to be met with some uh, rejection and question, uh, especially for whom this gospel is preached to the unknown people, such as the shepherds in the field. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's obviously a very familiar text and one way, yeah, I mean, there's always different ways into it, right? For whom is this good news? How is this good news? Why is this good news? What are people expecting when they hear words of things like, uh, a, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord, this will be a sign for you. I mean, all of these, the shepherds are clearly blown away because there's an angel talking to them yeah. and then a heavenly host that shows up, but there's a content as well to the message that's got them stirred up. I would imagine. Oh yeah, definitely. And it, it, that sense of the way in which it, I, that was one thing that I wanted to highlight was just, uh, just their, you know, their response, but also what, but also what is being said to them. And it, this is one of the, also another theme in Luke of the response of praise and the response of glorifying God for all they had heard and seen just as it had been told them. So now we're going into 15 through 20, but we've already had hymns of praise right up until this point of the Magnificat of, of, uh, who am I missing? Elizabeth in, in a certain kind of way. Uh, and, and we'll get more hymns of praise. And so this is a, and this is where maybe people would want to bring in the Psalm. Uh, and I don't know that we'll say too much about the Psalm, but that this is a, what will be the response to this good news. And for some, it is going to be threat and rejection and others it's praise. And yeah. so that might be a homiletical entry into Christmas. What is your response to this good news? What it, how are, and then how are you hearing it this year? Uh, we've had some, um, 
challenging times, in particularly in the States, uh, the last couple of months or last six weeks. And so how is how is Christmas, how are you experiencing Christmas? Can you praise? Um, where does that, what is, how does, how is that different this time around? Yeah, I like that. I like that. And for what are you hoping? What are you expecting the future to bring the nobody's expecting a Messiah who's going to die on a cross. So, I mean, there still is surprise yet to come in this story, but the fact that it's unabashedly good news that God has remembered God's people, that God has come near, that God has visited Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is is all you need to know at this point. I mean, in in terms of the shepherds and and the Holy family and Luke's gospel, but Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there will be more to come and it won't all be necessarily uh, pleasant or easy, and to note some of that as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just I, I well, I want to say a couple of things. One is the the kind of the odd juxtaposition of this heavenly host mm. who show up, and host is a term that means a lot of people, but it also has militaristic imagery. It's a, it's an mm. army. I don't think it necessarily means militaristic, but also, and you've got in, in Jewish tradition at the time, an understanding of angels as not just messengers, but as uh, warriors or as people who join the struggle on God's behalf against mm-hmm. other forces. And so mm-hmm. it's interesting that what could be seen as a display of power, all of these angels showing up, they're not here to fight, they're here to celebrate. Mm-hmm. in this story. Yes, it's a display of divine strength, but that's not what's emphasized, I don't think. Yeah. Like, there's no threats issued here. There's no, there's a new sheriff in town kind of statement here. The angels have shown up to praise and to provide leadership in praise and confidence mm-hmm. in God. And that's, mm-hmm. I don't mean that in like an Apollyanna-ish or a naive way, but I just mean that to say that even here from the outset, power is not being exercised in the way you might expect it to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're going to ask the question, what's it like when God shows up in the world to set things right? And that, I think that connects to, for me, Matt, that connects to one of the places in the story that I think that you could drop down as a preacher is verse 12. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And so that what happens after the colon is really unexpected. I mean, we know it, right? I mean, we know from years and years and years and years of experiencing this story. Uh, But, but how do you kind of have that expectation? Okay. What's going to be the sign? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a child wrapped in bands of cloth (laughs) and lying in a manger. That's not the sign we expected. (laughs) Right. You're going to discover something utterly ordinary. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's going to be the sign. And that's where things like Isaiah Isaiah 9 are interesting. It's where Isaiah 7 is interesting. It's just a... Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I also like that other gospels besides John speak of signs. Yes, very true. But that, but as you said, like the sign is ordinary, uh, is a... I think a way to enter into also the theology of Christmas uh, mm-hmm. that that the inc- the incarnation that God enters into the ordinariness of of life of human life and and it might be an invitation for people to experience Christmas this year that maybe maybe Christmas this year is going to be ordinary and ordinary is okay after a lot of, shall we say, extraordinary or unprecedented kind of events uh, over the course of the last couple yeah. of months in our lives and in our, in our, you know, in our world. Uh, and so maybe ordinariness is really, really going to be the good news this year. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I am I am one who worries about the ways in which norms are about to get redefined and in some cases taken away and how things might become uh, very mean. And so one point one question is how do you insist that there are still 
norms. There are still basic standards around human dignity, around community, around what it means to be a neighbor to somebody else. And Mm -hmm. so there's that norm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's normal if you're the shepherds who are looking for a house with a newborn. It's utterly extraordinary if you're Mary or if you're Joseph or if you're Elizabeth or if you're Zechariah, who knows something, they know the bigger story that's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one other thing about uh, this text and then we can move on to Isaiah or Titus, but also the, the vocabulary that Luke draws on verse 14 and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Uh, You, you have so many different words for, that get translated the same way, but they're not, they're not the same word, like those whom he favors or regards. Uh, and, uh, but just the way in which Luke is working that out, of course, in the first couple of chapters or, for, you know, the first chapter with, with Mary and Elizabeth, uh, but the, but that, uh, and then the Magnificat, but the way in which, uh, again, we have peace among those whom God, you know, whom God, um, regards or whom God uh, has goodwill or favor toward. And uh, and so that's another theme that I think you could trace right through um, through what we've already experienced in Luke and then here. Yeah. Yeah. My mother doesn't like this translation. She doesn't. No, she told me this one year after the church service. What what does she when I believe like- uh, we, I believe the way she put it was why did they change the words? And I said, who's they? And then I think she said, why did you change the words? I said, I had nothing to do with it, but <laughs> it was Bible scholar. <laughs> she prefers goodwill toward men, ah. goodwill toward people, which has a nice ring to it. But yeah, I think what she heard in this was exclusion, that peace only among the people God likes, as if this is oh. a kind of like set yeah. aside elect group, as opposed to a general statement of God's benevolence toward all. And I said, it still means that it's, this is a better translation of the Greek. And she said something like, I don't care what the Greek says. I liked it better the old way. (laughs) And my mother's not fusty like that, but she had a good point. Yeah. No, I I, like no room in the inn more than I like no place in the guest room. So there's there's me, there's me weighing in with my, with my grouchy, my Christmas Grinch. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Isaiah, should we go to? Yes. I love this text. I love this text read at night before Christmas Yeah, with candles. I love this text read slowly and solemnly, at least especially at the beginning of the first half of it. It's yeah. the poetry in here is uh, extraordinary to me. Why? Oh, <laughs> that's all I want to say. Uh-huh. No, I... I, okay. I You know, there is imagination here. There's description here of real suffering and real oppression. Yeah. People walking in darkness, having seen a great light in a land of deep darkness. This is not talking about people's ignorance and suddenly being brought to knowledge. And the Blake Cooey's commentary brings this out. Yeah. This is shadow of death language. This is people walking like in, in the Psalm, this is people who live in hopelessness, people who are surrounded by death. Uh, and then to talk about rejoicing as with joy at the harvest, as people mm-hmm. exult when dividing plunder. Those are two really interesting images. Mm-hmm. Joy at the harvest, when you can have a feast, when everybody celebrates, mm-hmm. when the food is yours and you're not being taxed by a foreign nation that's that's taking its tribute, but also when dividing plunder. I mean, here's a Here's a a militaristic, a triumphalistic image for people who understand war and its cost. And so that's interesting. You know, the yoke of their burden, you have broken. They have a broken yoke. And then the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. Yeah. Yeah. I I hear that red and I see it. I see a bonfire with the implements Mm -hmm. of war. And of invaders being burned to give light, to give warmth, or just to destroy them so they will never be used again. And there's something about that that is just a hopeful image. Now it moves on. For a child has been, I mean, this is why there's hope. But just to state that, yeah, 
you this is why you need poets in the church this is why you need visionaries you need dreamers well and that that at that hope is is comes at the very beginning right uh this is what the commentary commentary brings out that uh we we've seen a great light but we're waiting for it to shine in its fullness or a distant bright a distant brightness heralds the possibility of change uh and that that's what really uh grabbed me this time of of how how what difference even that small bit of light can make uh in in the darkest of places and uh and you don't really know what that light is going to reveal yet and you don't know uh it ha- it it hasn't reached its full potential but you know the promise of light uh, and what it can do and the effect of light. And then, you know, and especially of course, and we're in the darkest times of the year. And, uh, and, and then, as you said, like reading this on Christmas Eve, it's, you know, it's dark in the church candles and such. And so you can really, um, help people, I think, to focus on that one little, that one little candle and how it makes a difference for, uh, your mood and your um, what you're what you're able to see, even when you didn't think that there was any light or uh, any possibility for that kind of hope. So, yeah, yeah, it's a very hopeful text, and and a lot of, as you said, a lot of beautiful imagery that just ties into the hopefulness of Christmas. It, it raises questions around power. You know, verses six through seven can be taken as you know this could be about Hezekiah. This could be about mm-hmm. this text has traction. It has purchase in its ancient context mm-hmm. and secondarily about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Secondarily, I don't mean not important. I mean, it's true again, true for, in a new way in a new time right? about Jesus, but to not let the lo- the language of the throne of his, in his kingdom establish and uphold with justice and righteousness Again, this is a different kind of king we're talking about when it's Jesus who's involved. You know, what I mean, this is not yeah. a statement of we've moved out of darkness into a time where now, hey, we've got power, or our guy's got power, and it's going to be great. I mean, this is still, this text still needs to be normed in a Christian setting by the question of what kind of a king is Jesus, what kind of a ruler is Jesus. Yeah. And then that, I think I know I've said this over the years, and so I'll just say it again because maybe people forgot what I said three years, you know, last year, <laughs> or maybe I did. Just you know, as a hypothetical, <laughs> maybe people forgot. But yeah, but that authority is located in four really precise titles that mm-hmm. you could explore: Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And, and that peace is connected, great will be his authority, and there shall be endless peace, that peace is connected with that authority. And so, uh, so the way in which we think about what that authority is, we get some specifics here that could matter for a sermon or, yeah, for a preacher to say, what does it mean to call our, our God, our a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And how, and then how might we live that beyond, beyond this evening? Who does not want a wonderful counselor Yeah, in this crazy world? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, all, we all need that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on the Psalm because I don't think people are going to preach on the Psalm on Christmas Eve, but no. sing, sing, sing. And, you know, let heaven and nature sing, right? This is a psalm where uh, everybody sings, even the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it, it what I said earlier that it ties into, or it's, a, it's an expression of the praise and, and the rejoicing of that's the response to what God has done. And so the ways in which you can uh, imagine this song being used in that way or sing it or something, but yeah, uh, it's just, it, you know, what does, if you go back to, you know, if you go back to the text uh, that the shepherds return glorifying and praising God, that the, that the content of that praising could be the Psalm. Uh, right. Right. 
that's what I would, that's what I would do. Yes. And a king who will judge the peoples with equity, which Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, every society seems to wonder why that's so hard. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) But what a promise. Yes. Uh, Okay. Titus. If it's Christmas, it must mean Titus. Titus is time to shine. (laughs) Christmas Eve and Christmas morning. Yes, I know. Um, These are the best verses in Titus. <laughs> right. If you yeah. don't believe me, my question is, which ones do you like better? I can't answer that. <laughs> I'd have to look back and read all of Titus. Yeah. Oh, Titus, such a great verse. Okay. Uh, but, but, but verse 11, right? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. Isn't that a summary of what Christmas is? Uh, yes. I would even say, it. not that a summary of the gospel? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we talk about what grace is, uh, but in on Christmas, grace is embodied in, in, in Jesus. And what difference does that make to think about, uh, to think about grace is in that embodied form and not just, not just character, a characteristic of God or God is, God is, you know, God is about grace, but what, how does, how is grace experienced then in, yeah, in Jesus in the manger? That's that I, that could be worth a sermon, I think. Oh yeah. And what's it look like, right? We're going to see this in a parent welcoming a child home. We're going to see this in Jesus eating meals with all sorts of people and Mm -hmm. declaring their new status. We're going to see it in a variety of acts of mercy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the, the language. I think I say this every Christmas because Titus shows up every Christmas, this language of appearance, which is a, it's epiphany language. I mean, the, the epiphanos, it's, it's this actual, that's the actual Greek word. And as is the, uh, the word manifestation in verse mm-hmm. 13 are both, these are both epiphany words. So I am, I'm, I'm working on a, on a book about Advent, which will come out mm-hmm. in roughly uh, 11 months from now. And that's, I, I actually spend time with Titus 2, 11 through 13 to point out that even in the Bible, the the arrival of Jesus, the expectation of Jesus, the appearance, the epiphany of Jesus is connected to the fulfillment of all things. That Christmas can't help but look ahead to a future appearance of, of Jesus. And that's part of how we mark Advent, how part of how we celebrate Christmas. That it's not looking back into the past with nostalgia and romance and and saying it would have been so nice to be there. Look how happy everybody is. Mm -hmm. But it's also something that empowers us toward a future, toward an expectation of the time when God will keep all of God's promises. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and happy birthday. Thank you. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.